dollar, dollar, dollar. Dirt and money, no soul. Had to go and get it, ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't neglect me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems. Yo. Let's get a bridge and no Just stay something. in your room. Nope. You've been just stay in your room. Okay. Nope. Stay in your room. Okay. I've right. been I've been hitting the straight. Just you've whoop. been doing pretty good. I just been whoop. Okay. And I'm just I'm in and out. Okay. I'm just been, okay. Pew. I got you. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's your boy DJ Duke, your girl. Sierra Nicole. We're back on the channel with another Kit and see original. All right. <laughs> hey man, welcome, welcome back to the channel, man. We got Mr. Baller, man. Y'all know we do the weekly segments. We gonna start cranking them out a little bit more since y'all said we ain't gonna try to take all the man content. Damn, yeah. bro. But I like, do like I do enjoy it. Though. I do. We do enjoy them. Y'all, yeah. y'all seem to enjoy them. We don't want to take all this content. Y'all gonna show love and support them and watch the original video. But a lot of people like to hear other people takes. That's why they be like, yeah. so you know what I'm saying? I feel you. Mm -hmm. I feel you. But we got top three stories that sound fake but are 100 real. Part mm -hmm. eight. So with that being said. Make sure you check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go, man. If you want to first part, you got to do it. Check out down below. Also, every single time we salute to the comment of the day. Salute to you. We highly appreciate y'all, man. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, just leave a like. We highly appreciate yes. that. But again, top three stories that sound fake but are 100% real. real. Part eight. Let's get it. Yep. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and today I'm going to share three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to come over your house and play Mortal Kombat. And when they do, play real Mortal Kombat and uppercut them into the ceiling. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 2013, Jim Stoffer's mother finally passed away from Alzheimer's disease at the age of 74. Her doctors told Jim that her disease had mutated in a way they had not seen before, and they asked if he'd be willing to donate her body so they could study her brain. Jim felt like his mother would want him to say yes, and so he agreed. But for a variety of administrative reasons, the neurologists couldn't actually accept Jim's mother's body. At this point, Jim was really bought into the idea that his mother's brain was going to help other patients. And so while he couldn't donate her body to these neurologists, he could donate her body to the Biological Resource Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This center would take dead bodies and then extract parts of them for scientific research and then would cremate the rest of them and return the ashes to the family. Jim gave his mother's body to the center, and when he filled out the paperwork, he indicated that her brain should be extracted for Alzheimer's research. After filling out the paperwork, Jim left, and 10 days later, he received a wooden box in the mail that contained his mother's ashes. There was no note attached to the box explaining exactly what was done to his mother's body, but Jim assumed they did what he asked. A year later, that biological resource center was raided by the FBI after accusations they were selling these donated bodies for profit. During the FBI's investigation, they uncovered that yes, the center had been doing that and had sold at least 20 bodies to the U.S. Army for various experiments. What? And one of the bodies that was sold was Jim's mother. She was sold for $5,893. The FBI told Jim, What is the military doing with the body? What the? What? The military? Yes! What the fuck is wrong? What the? I have... Why, for one, why are y'all selling people dead? I have... Two, why the military but dying? Exactly. Dead? Um, okay. Mm. His mother. She was sold for $5,893. The FBI told Jim she had not been used for Alzheimer's research. Instead, she had been strapped to this device that resembled a chair and then had a bomb detonated underneath her. The army was trying to understand the effects on the human body when a vehicle is hit by an IED. The ashes Jim received in that wooden box he got in the mail were only from his mother's hand. The rest of her body was unrecoverable. 
Also during this FBI investigation, they found inside the center, there was a man's body on the wall with a female head sewed onto it. It appeared to be a trophy. Jim, along with 19 other families, sued the center. And finally, in 2019, they were awarded $58 million in damages. Wow. The center no longer is in operation. That is motherfucking. Yo. That's some crazy ass. Yo. That's some crazy Oh my gosh. Have you ever heard it? Have, have you? Yo, now I'm about to go do like so much. Extensive research. Yes. Like what the never world? Never heard such a thing. Never heard such. Y'all playing with people. Pe I'm not. I understand it, but it's fucked up. It'll be different if that's what he signed his mother's body over yeah, yeah, to yeah. be. You know. But can't y'all y'all could have just made fake bodies. Y'all really could have made dummy bodies. They could to, have. Like all the signs we got now, y'all can make dummy bodies to have. resemble exactly they could have how just a that. real body is. But the fact that y'all take some, like, come on now. So, That's crazy. Yeah. In 2004, Mitch was in his final semester at a college in Louisiana when he met another senior, a wonderful young lady named Kayla. From the instant he saw her, he knew he was in love. She played hard to get at first, but after several months, he won her over. After graduation, the pair stayed in Louisiana and moved in together while they got their careers off the ground. Two years later, the pair got married and almost immediately Kayla got pregnant. At the time, Mitch's career was really starting to take off, which allowed Kayla to stay at home and take some time off. By the time their daughter was born, Mitch was making so much money that Kayla decided to just stay home and be a full-time mom. A couple years later, Kayla got pregnant again, and by the time their daughter was two years old, they had their son. Mitch adored his children. Every morning before he went to work, he would sneak into their room and he would watch them sleep. And then in the evenings, they would have these big family sit-down meals and then play games together until bedtime. Mitch's life was perfect. Shortly after his son's birth, Mitch was lounging on the couch in his TV room when he noticed out of the corner of his eye, the red lamp in the corner of the room, it just looked funny. It was almost like the light itself was blurry, but when he looked a little bit closer at it, the entire lamp looked blurry. And so Mitch looked around the room and nothing else was blurry. He rubbed his eyes and looked back over at this lamp and it was still blurry. He turned the TV off and walked over to the lamp and even though he was right in front of it, the lamp was still blurry. And Mitch didn't have bad eyesight and so he's thinking, is there something wrong with me? Am I having a stroke? Do I have an aneurysm? Is there some sort of illness here that's making me see this lamp blurry when it's really not? But Mitch told himself he was healthy and that whatever this was, it was an anomaly and nothing to worry about. And so he went back over to the couch, turned the TV back on, and tried to ignore the lamp. But as he was watching TV, out of his peripheral vision, he couldn't help but notice this weird blurry lamp. And so finally, he turned the TV off again, and he turned to look at this lamp. And now, in addition to being blurry, it appeared to be upside down. Now Mitch was genuinely concerned that there was something wrong with him, because again, nothing else in the entire room was blurry or upside down. It was just this lamp. And so a few minutes is he is he alone by himself? Like it's the wife and kids yeah, gone yeah. or are I they sleep? I ain't pay attention. I ain't know if yeah. he said that part or not. I didn't hear him say uh, where they were. All right else in the entire room was blurry or upside down. It was just this lamp. And so a few minutes later, his wife and his kids came home oh. and Mitch decided he would not tell them about this lamp. He didn't want to alarm them. He figures he will get to the bottom of this blurry lamp and then he will tell his wife and kids. And so that night, the family has a sit down meal and then afterwards they play some games together and then everybody goes upstairs and goes to sleep. But after everyone had gone to sleep, Mitch was just laying in bed thinking about this lamp. And so finally he snuck out of his bed bed and went downstairs to the TV room and he sat on the couch and he just stared at this lamp. And for hours and hours, he just fixated himself on this lamp, watching it kind of morph around and turn upside down and get blurrier and blurrier by the second. The next day, Kayla found Mitch lying on the couch, passed out, and she asked him if he was okay. And again, Mitch didn't tell her about this lamp that was still blurry. He just told her that he wasn't feeling well and he was not gonna go to work that day. But Mitch didn't go to work for three more days. He just sat on the couch and stared at this lamp. And Kayla obviously picked up on this strange behavior and kept poking and prodding to get more information about what was going on. But Mitch never told her the truth about this lamp. He just kept telling her he felt sick. 
She urged him to go see a doctor, but Mitch told her it would be fine, he'd get better. And then over time, as this lamp continued to morph and get bigger and get stranger and stranger, Mitch suddenly was unable to respond to his wife. He became totally unresponsive. And so obviously his wife became desperate and called the doctor. And as she's on the phone with the doctor trying to get advice about what to do, Mitch realizes the lamp is now growing in leaps and bounds. And before long, the lamp is the entire size of the room and all he can see is the red color of this lamp. And then Mitch starts to hear these voices, these screams coming from somewhere in the distance. And then he feels this blinding pain in his head. And then he opens his eyes and he looks up and he sees he's laying on the sidewalk next to one of the buildings at his college in Louisiana. And surrounding him is this crowd of people with wide eyes that are staring at him. Mitch had no idea what was going on. And so he naturally just began scanning the crowd, looking for Kayla and his kids to try to figure out, you know, how he got here. But before he could ask any questions and before he could find his wife and kids, a police officer ran through the crowd, picked him up and ran him over to his police car put him in the back and then began driving away. And so while Mitch is in the back of this police car, he turns to the officer and he says, what's going on? And the officer would tell him he was attacked by a huge college football player. He got hit in the head and he fell backwards and he hit his head again and he fell unconscious. Mitch asked the officer where his wife and kids were and the cop said he had no idea. And that's when it clicked for Mitch. The lamp wasn't real. Neither was his wife, neither was his daughter, neither was his son, neither was his life. For the past 10 years, it was all a hallucination while he was unconscious after getting attacked. Mitch was brought to the hospital where he would make a full physical recovery, but after being released, he was horribly depressed and he had to get intense therapy to basically grieve for the loss of his family that never existed. These days, Mitch says he can barely remember what his family even looked like, but periodically in his dreams, he will catch a glimpse of his son in his peripheral vision, and his son is perpetually five years old, and he's trying to talk to his father, but Mitch can never understand what he says. Did he, was he foreshadowing? Or did he get, you know, let me, let me we're going to here, all right? Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going? Mm-mm. Or was he not the unconscious where his subconscious mind tapped into his other like a past, past his past, past life, life or something? And he, he could see everything happen in his past life, but now when he wakes up, because the when well, you get knocked yeah, unconscious, yeah, yeah. you it's like your like you always say, you travel. Yeah. Because you're not a sense of like when yourself. you sleep or when you like whatever. Like, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Did he possibly Who knows? That's definitely debatable. Or did he foreshadow for is it foreshadow? Like he seeing into the future or what could have possibly been possibly been his life, but he was so stuck on you know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know. Like, it's debatable. Like, since he was unconscious, like... A lot of people, if they believe in, like, in, in the past, like... You, yeah. Yeah, you had that a past have, life, yeah, reincarnation. Here, yeah, stuff like that. A lot of people would believe that he, he tapped into his past life and everything he experienced. And that light was the... was That yeah. lamp represented a light, a connection. To of, something. To, yeah. To, you know what I'm saying? That is so... Crazy. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, where they get this lamp from? Like, what type of lamp is this? But the whole time, everything is not real. Yeah, it's crazy. In 2007, Brett Ryan was a charming 26-year-old man living in Toronto, Canada. He was known as an extremely friendly guy who was always smiling ear to ear with his trademark grin. In his spare time, he could be found at children's hospitals reading to sick kids or at the community center volunteering as an umpire for Little League baseball games. But behind his seemingly perfect exterior, behind the scenes, Brett was struggling. He had to move back in with his parents after dropping out of college and racking up over $60,000 of debt. While his friends grabbed graduated college and went on to begin their careers in medicine and finance and education, Brett was only able to get a job as a part-time house painter. Brett felt like he had a lot of potential that he was squandering, but he felt like the debt that he had racked up was really his roadblock between him and the life he was supposed to have. And so instead of working hard and making some money to pay down his debt, he decided to come up with an absurd get-rich-quick scheme that actually kind of worked. On October 20th of that year, Brett walked into a bank near his home and he had hot 
hospital bandages wrapped around his head and his face, and his left arm was in a sling. Then he walked up to one of the tellers and he handed her a note that just said, I have a gun underneath this sling, give me $2,000. And the teller very quickly complied and she gave him a little over $1,000, that was all the money she had, and Brett took the money, turned around, and calmly walked out of the bank. And he got in his car and he got home and he was totally exhilarated and he's half expecting the police to just show up at his front door, but they never did. He was never caught. And after that, he was hooked. For the next eight months, Brett robbed a dozen other banks in the area, stealing almost $30,000. He became so confident in his ability to steal without getting caught that he began dressing up in these ridiculous outfits that included this huge, obviously fake beard. And in fact, the media dubbed him the fake bearded bandit. The reason Brett wasn't getting caught is because the police would get his fingerprints at the crime scene, but because he did not have a criminal record, his prints were not in the database. And so the police basically just had to set up and hope to catch this guy in the act. And in the summer of 2008, they finally would catch the fake bearded bandit. At Brett's trial, dozens of his friends wrote letters of support to the judge saying that Brett was actually a great guy, that this was a product of desperation and a total break from his normal character. And some of the organizations that he volunteered with did the same thing, writing letters to the judge saying what a meaningful contributor Brett was to the community. When Brett spoke at his trial, he was incredibly remorseful and said he had allowed his debt to get totally out of control and that admittedly, he had not handled it well. And so the judge took all of this into account, all the letters of support and Brett's overall appearance in court, and he decided that this was indeed a break from character and that Brett was actually a very promising young man and that he did not deserve the harshest penalty. And so Brett was sentenced to just under four years, which considering the crime was a very lenient sentence. And so Brett- That's fucked up. That is very like- How many banks he robbed? Over and, a dozen. And, and you, you only get four years? That is crazy. You must know some powerful folks to write you some letters. That. Or it was just because of the, the outburst from like the community because he volunteered different places he worked with. Like, I don't like, care, bro. You know what I'm saying? Then his uh, friends that are now like in medicine and finance and stuff. I and have some, these... Yeah, some power. No, I was saying yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. But that's, we know, bro. That's crazy. We all know to jail, but then less than two years later in 2010, he was granted parole and allowed to move back in with his parents. And his parents would say he was a changed man ready for a fresh start. But Brett would find life outside of jail was exponentially harder now that he was an ex-con. It was extremely hard to get a job, which meant he had no income. And without an income, he couldn't pay down all those debts he had. And so he had to declare bankruptcy. As for life at home, it was very difficult. Brett's family was very embarrassed about what he had done and when Brett moved back home, it was obvious that all the neighbors were gossiping constantly about their family. And so Brett and his family actually moved to another Toronto neighborhood just to get away from all of that. But once they settled into this new neighborhood, Brett really knuckled down and decided he was gonna get his life together and he was gonna do it all on his own. And so he applied to dozens and dozens of jobs all over the place. And finally, he was able to get some low paying work in retail wasn't great, but it was a start. And so Brett began working countless hours at this really low paying job. And his parents noticed how hard he was working to try to get his life back together. And so they decided they would help him out financially so he could re-enroll in college and finish his degree in biophysics. While Brett was in school, he met a woman named Kristen who had a full-time job and lived in this beautiful home. And by and large, she had the life that he wished he could have. And the two of them quickly fell in love. And Brett told her about his criminal past as the fake bearded bandit. And and she accepted him and she didn't judge him. And she said, I still love you. I still want to be with you. Two years later, Brett moved out of his parents' house and into Kristen's house. And for once in his life, he felt like his life was going the way it should be. Then a year later, tragedy struck when Brett's father passed away. And suddenly Brett had to go to his mother's house all the time to try to help her out. And his mother was very appreciative of the time he was spending with her. And so she actually began paying him for the work he was doing around the home. And considering Brett was a broke college student, this was a huge help. And in many ways, it really brought Brett and his mother together. A year later in 2015, Brett proposed to Kristen and she said yes. But at the same time, school was getting overwhelming for Brett and he dropped out but he was too embarrassed to tell his fiance or his family because everybody thought he was on the right path and he didn't want to explain why he had dropped out. And so he just pretended to still be in school. Then- But you still should have told somebody. Like, At least you know the woman that you- Engaged to right, plan on building your- This future like, Yeah, like- You know what I'm saying? 
And I'm sure if she's understandable for all that, she'll right? understand. If you have a decent conversation, would it be like, hey, I'm, he- I'm trying to deal with this, dealing with that, still trying to get over my father. It, it's it's just lot. too. It's just too much right now right. for me, and I'm just. I need a break. She. She probably or maybe know. he felt like if I tell her this, she's gonna dump me. Then she's gonna dump me because, because I have no future. Right. You know? I, yeah. Yeah. But I still. Still, you gotta be open and honest. Excuse. Yeah. In the spring of 2016, when Brett should have been graduating, he got a very lucky break when a big tech firm in Toronto offered him a job. On paper, Brett should not have gotten this job. He wasn't qualified, he didn't have a degree. But in getting this job, Brett was able to tell his fiance and his family that he had just graduated college and that was how he was getting this job. His family and his fiance were a little confused why they weren't invited to his graduation ceremony, but nonetheless, they were very excited for him and they took him out and they celebrated. Then then a week after Brett accepted this job, the tech firm rescinded their offer when they discovered Brett was in fact the fake bearded bandit. Now Brett panicked because this job represented this perfect piece to his web of lies that allowed him to pretend he had his degree and that everything was so great, and so he couldn't possibly tell his fiance and his family that he didn't get this job. And so he decided he would just lie and pretend to go to this job every day. Meanwhile, Brett's mom began bragging to all of her new neighbors about her son, Brad, who had really turned his life around. He graduated from college, he got this great job, he's got a beautiful fiance, he's got this wonderful home. Everything is just going great for Brett. At first, Brett was able to push the guilt out of his subconscious and just live this ridiculous lie. But as his wedding day approached, the weight of all these lies and the guilt he felt, it became overwhelming. And practically speaking, he was worried about how he would explain to his new wife why he had no income despite having this full-time job. And so he went to his mother and he told her the truth about dropping out of college, about not getting that job offer. And then he said, can you keep all of this a secret? And can you give me a whole bunch of money so I can keep living this lie? And she said, no. And in fact, you need to tell your fiance that you're lying or I will. This was the worst case scenario for Brett and one that he was not prepared for. He really thought his mom would be like, yep, let's do it, let's keep this thing going. But when she didn't, he didn't really know what to do. He believed if Kristen found out the truth, she would leave him and that would ruin his perfect life. And so he decided he would not tell Kristen, instead he would kill his mother. Because he was an ex-con, he couldn't buy a firearm, however, he could buy a crossbow. And so he ordered his crossbow, he watched a couple YouTube videos about how to operate it, and then on one of his trips to his mother's house to help out, he stashed the crossbow and some arrows on a shelf in her garage. Then when he got home, he began designing these bizarre contraptions that were built out of fans and pulleys and broomsticks that when turned on would move around the room and click on his keyboard and turn his phone off and on. It was designed to help him build an alibi when he was out committing murder. His devices would be turning on and off again, giving the impression that he was at home the whole time. On August 25th, 2017, all his preparations were done. He woke up early that morning and he began getting ready for his fake job. At the same time, Kristen was also getting ready for her real job. And then at 7.30, when they were both ready to go, they hopped in their respective cars and headed out for the day. You did all this. Bro, you smart as fuck. You did all this. You know how much time, talent, and like, you did all this, bro. That is crazy. And even that, I give them that. Very smart, whatever. But in the midst of making all this stuff, you didn't have like a, that's my mama. You know what I'm saying? Conscious decision, like your conscious, your self-conscious didn't kick in. You ain't hear no like, feeling of remorse. Uh, like, I'm not going to do this to my mama. Let me just tell this woman that I sleep with every night and wake up to the truth. And like you said, she accepted you. You got a freaking... Criminal history. Why you Criminal background. Like, why whatever. Why you saying like that? Because it's the truth. And she still loved you. That's oh, love. Lord. <laughs> Brett slowed down at the end of the street and waited for Kristen to disappear around the corner. Brett turned back, went back into his house. He went up to his room and turned on all of his bizarre alibi contraptions that he made sure were turning off and on his devices correctly. And after a while, once he was confident these devices would work, he hopped in his car and he drove over to his mother's house. He got there around 10 a.m. He walked inside and his mother was sitting in the kitchen and he approached her about changing her mind about telling the truth to Kristen. But his mother was staunch and she said, no, I'm going to tell her before your wedding unless you do. 
And so their exchange got really heated, and before long, his mother actually called one of his older brothers, Chris, to come to her house and talk to Brett to defuse the situation. Brett was furious and stormed out of the kitchen. He grabbed the door that led into the garage, and he stormed in to try to get his crossbow off the shelf. But his mother followed after him. Now, the crossbow had not been loaded when he put it up on that shelf, and Brett was not very good at loading it, and it would take several seconds to actually do it. So he's thinking to himself, when I pull that down and begin loading it, she's going to see the weapon and she's going to run outside before I can get to her. And so when he reached up, he didn't grab the crossbow, he grabbed the arrows. And in a swift motion, he pulled them down, regripped them like a knife, faced his mother and began attacking her viciously. She fell backwards and a shelf actually landed on top of her, pinning her to the ground. At which point, Brett seized the opportunity. He got up, grabbed a piece of nylon, he wrapped it around her neck and he suffocated her. As soon as she was dead, Brett pulled her out from under the shelf and dragged her to the side of the garage. He put the shelf back up and then he began loading his crossbow because he knew Chris, his older brother that his mother had called, was going to be here soon. And so he hid behind the door inside of the garage and just waited. And at some point he heard Chris's car pull into the driveway. Chris walked into the house, he yelled for his mom, he yelled for Brett, but he didn't get a response. And eventually Chris made his way to the open door leading into the garage. He stepped inside and as soon as he did, Brett silently got up behind him and he fired one shot directly into the back of his neck, killing him instantly. Oh, Brett took God. Chris's body and piled it on top of his mother's. And as he was putting a tarp over top of them, he heard another car pulling into the driveway. It was his younger brother, AJ. Now, at this point, Brett knows he is in too deep and he has to finish the job. And so he doesn't have time to load his crossbow. And so again, he just grabs one of the arrows and he walks outside and he sees AJ getting out of his car and he runs up to him and he jabs the arrow into his brother's neck. And so they're fighting in the driveway. Meanwhile, Brett's other brother, Lee, who's actually in the house sleeping, he wakes up to the sound of this commotion outside in the driveway. He looks out the window and he sees his brothers fighting. And so he runs downstairs and he comes outside and at this point, AJ is laying on the ground and he's basically motionless and Brett is standing over him and Brett turns and he sees Lee in the doorway and he runs off what? after him. Lee sees his brother running at him and just turns and runs into the house, but he only gets a few feet before Brett jumps on top of them. And then the two of them have this vicious fight where Brett is trying to stab him with the arrows and they're basically both fighting for their lives. And at some point after Lee suffered several very deep cuts, he manages to throw Brett off of him and he runs outside to his brother AJ, who's now crawled all the way to the street. And in fact, AJ had managed to flag down a neighbor and got his neighbor to call the police. As for Brett, after Lee had managed to fight him off and ran outside, he knew he was done. And so instead of chasing his brother outside, he put his arrow down and he walked into the kitchen. He opened up the fridge. He took a bottle of water out. He left the fridge door open and just walked out to the front steps and sat down and drank his water while he waited for police to show up. When they did arrive, his brother AJ died before they could save him. As police were arresting Brett, he kind of casually said, yeah, I should have taken AJ to the hospital. I could have saved him. And the other guys in the garage are dead. Crossbow to the head. It was me. In court, Brett was extremely remorseful and pled guilty to all of his charges. The judge told Brett that he was appreciative of the fact that he was taking full ownership of his heinous crimes and that in many ways he was a victim too, a victim of this huge web of lies that Brett just couldn't get out from under. But nonetheless, Brett was given three consecutive life terms, one for each of the murders he committed. The only surviving family member, Lee, the brother who was attacked last and managed to run outside and escape Brett, he said that his life was shattered that day and that he can barely go outside because of his extreme post-traumatic stress. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode. Brett, like, what the hell you was thinking, though? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, my thing is, you... you I didn't can't... know he had all these brothers from the jump. Right, all these brothers? He's and one was already living with you, so he... That's the how thing. How you know he didn't already hear the commotion? And why not go get Lee and why call all the other brothers over there? Because maybe the older... She know that the older brother can probably talk some sense, you know, and to, or whatever the case is. You don't know, like, how the relationship really is or how they, like, are with each other. And Brenda, he a dumbass. Yes. Did you not think... You didn't Lee think about your, house. You, didn't, you didn't think about look. You don't remember and then, the names. Then you didn't think about well. She did call Chris, right? So I can't go through you, it today. You can't. Like you forgot about all your brothers in in the midst of all of this. And you go ahead. No, my thing. My my thing is you. You killed your your mom. 
your older brother, and your younger brother tried to kill Lee all because you didn't want to tell your wife that you one, didn't graduate. A, you I didn't graduate, <laughs> and B, I really don't have this job. I did get the offer. Yeah. But they reneged. Because you know, they found out my criminal who I history. was. And they could they no. And she would have been understanding and she probably would have been like, Okay, that's fine. Let, let's keep trying. Let's just but keep trying. Not something. even that. It was it was the fact that like he couldn't deal with the pr- he couldn't mentally he couldn't do deal with the pressure the the realization. I wouldn't even say the pressure, the realization that Everybody else has passed him. Right. That was his whole downfall. Yeah. Because he couldn't grasp the like. Because he looked at it like, damn. I'm looking because he kind of like how nowadays so many people looking at everybody's success on social mm-hmm. media, looking at everybody. Oh, this person got this. This person got this. Damn, bro. What am I doing with my life? And that can take a toll on someone's mental. Like that really so, can. So he went into. Robin. Yeah. But you get a break, my my G. You, you really get a break. break. You got a that and, a, and you ooh, went back you to school. Break, break. Now I understand shit happens in life. Trust me, you ain't the only person who has went through that, got a break, got another second chance, another second chance. to go back to school. Yeah. And then a parent might they might lose a parent. You ain't the only person who yeah. go through that. And then have to deal with helping, helping, because as your parents get older, yeah, we all of us have to go through the, go process, through the process of, of helping, helping our parents. You ain't the only one, and it was, it was he had to have this perfect life that he probably always envisioned. And that's what, it, yeah, that's what it is. And that's what it was, because because even the chick he ended up dating, did you really, 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 to be real, want to be with her? Or, or she you, had this perfect life, and you like, let me I gotta put, match that. Yes, I gotta or, match, or let me put myself in in her perfect life because this is always the life that I envision for myself. That kind of part of mm-hmm. part because it's like, do you really want to be with her, or she just adds the extra bonus, like, okay. Now I got the woman that got the nice money. We got a nice career. Now I'm going to put, because I'm with her, I'm going to put myself in that position too. Mm-hmm. So we can really be this power couple. Yeah. And that's that, it's, he got caught up in the, wanting this limelight lifestyle. I won't say. Not, uh, not, not I won't limelight. Say, I'll just but, say this perfect, this perfect lifestyle, this perfect life. That he always envisioned for himself. But that's not how... But when he wasn't able to... Even though she's able to provide and do what she do because she actually has a real job <laughs> making good. You know? And he wasn't able to do that same thing. You know what I'm saying? And as, yeah. you know, and as a man, I probably... Like, not being able to probably be a... And all, you know... Because all these people you went to college with, you was still able to call them up some type of way. Some, some Because way. They, they wrote a letter for you. Or... So you still had communication. Or even if you didn't call them up, they still, you still vouched had, for you. But you no, know, what I'm they, saying is you still have to have communication with all these people for them to even write a letter for you. Because it's like somebody who just random... Well, I went to school with Sierra. I went to college with her. So, no, you have to have some type of relationship with... No, no, no. I get that. You probably had some relationship with them. And so you seeing all, what I'm saying is you had some type of relationship with them and you seeing all the success that they have mm-hmm. because they finished college. They got the career they wanted and you like, damn, I flunked out. Maybe I, he should have just said and really like thought, man, college ain't for everybody. You know? Let me, and figure, to be honest, something, let me figure something. Let me go out here. He was a painter. And this is the thing. It's money. This is the thing. Regardless of the fact, that job that you got that offer for, regardless of the fact if you finished school or not, if you didn't go out here and rob all these banks, you could have gotten you a good paying job without a degree and made a good living for this. yourself. He probably lied on his resume too. Because think about it. They ask you on, a lot of times they ask you on your resume, are you a convicted felon? He probably it. said No. So once they did a background check, they found out, oh, yes. you that motherfucker. You that so, okay. So you always was hiding your yeah. truth, no matter who, no matter yeah, who, who it, it was, was that was asking the question. You always hid your yeah. truth. Yeah. And if you only at to the point was be able to be like, all right, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. 
Cause, cause maybe you wouldn't even told them about the job if you had put on your on your resume, I'm a convicted felon. They and then it, I don't think they could technically ask you what you was convicted for. I'm not 100 sure with that logic. I'm not sure, but I... maybe they would have denied you because they were like, "Well, he's a convicted felon." We really I think so. Him. If it acts like if it it says if so, can, like, but I don't know. I don't like, think they how... can really ask and go yeah, deep, I don't know. unless you lie. Yeah, but, I guess. I don't but know. But what I'm saying is. Maybe they wouldn't even offer you the job in the first place. So if you, you would have just told the truth, so you didn't even have. There would have been through. one less lie that you would have had to tell. Um, one less step you even had to deal with. I'm, it's just sad that. And then, oh my bad. No, I'm just going to say, it's just sad that so many people, lost, you know, lost yeah. their lives because of your lies and but that you didn't want to tell the truth. What I was going to say was, how was that even going to be your alibi that you was at home because your fiance you had already told her you was going to work. But your phone would have been at home, and your your and would have had activity. Like, she would have been like, you know, well, I thought you was headed to work. You would have had to true, come up with you know? another lie. <laughs> that is true. I don't know. It's just too much. That you was a lot. Stupid man. That was a lot. Hey man, y'all <laughs> spam us up in the comment section down below. Let us know y'all thoughts and opinions. We can go on and on about this dude because this like he didn't yeah. think that he he just acted on emotions it, and yeah. and the fact that. Nothing was everything was not perfect for him. Right. He that's the reason why he murdered all. That's what it it was a purpose. So he always tried to find a way to make everything everything accommodate to what he wants. To what he wants. I okay, this ain't perfect. I gotta find a way to to fix this. Oh, I gotta find a way to fix this. Let me clean this up. Let me do this. And it just got him in this turmoil. But whatever. (sighs) Man. (laughs) With that being said, y'all spam us up. Let us know y'all thoughts and opinions. But as always, y'all know how it go, Mm -hmm. man. I do go by the name of Jimmy Kid. This is Jerry Mouth. No sleep. Yeah. Had to go and get it. Ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar.